I want to introduce our last reader. I'm actually going to introduce two people. <laughs> um, Ramesh Shah is Chief Quality Officer at FONA International, or F-O-N-A, F-O-N-A International, a leading food flavor manufacturer. His goal is to bring amicable, resolu amicable re resolution to every customer dissatisfaction. His journey from the back streets of Bombay, now Mumbai, to this position is described in his soon to be published memoir, Tomorrow Will Be a Better Day, ghost written by his good friend, Richard Graves. Richard is a member of the St. Charles Writers Group and performs at local open mics. In 2013, he hosted Pro Project Publish, a BA TV reality show for writers and performers. Richard grew up in England, studied engineering, and worked in four countries before settling in the Fox Valley. Richard, do you want to come up first? And uh, or you can come up together. And <laughs> Thank you, Anna. OK, first I'd like to start off with uh, an announcement. So it was mentioned there, Project Publish. We, we did that in, uh, in uh, uh, 2013. Um, a TV show, a reality show, uh, where we paired writers and performers together and uh, let them perform live, uh, given a, a writing challenge to see what they did. And then we had judges who voted one off and we went from seven down to six, down to five, down to four, down to three, down to a five, and we ended up with uh, um, the, the winners of that competition. Now, um, I, was host, I was hosting that and uh, Kim Kozar at the time now, God, I don't get this right, um, Kim Lasilius, yes? And then, so she, 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 we did follow up immediately because Kim decided to do things like get married and change job and move house. And recently, she's come to a census and said, "Yes, we need to do another series of Project Publish." So we're looking to do that, and uh, more information on that will come in, in future weeks or months. So. Um, my introduction also said talk about engineering. I, I came to the U.S. You can tell I'm not from here. I come from England. I grew up in England. Um, I came uh, as, a, as an engineer, and uh, I worked for a multinational company, and, and I came to manage a project, and, and I set, we settled in um, Minnesota, and I was going to extend a, build, a factory, make it larger, and we were going to close down a plant in uh, Sarasota in Florida and move the production into that new location I was constructing. The company was also building a business center here in the Chicago area in the first states, and some of the people that worked down there were going to move there, and other people from around the country were going to come there. So um, I, I did that, and, and I met for the first time a microbiologist at this company, a small, relatively small company in Sarasota named Rich Shah. Well, at the end of that two-year project, they offered me a job, a regional job, to stay here in the US, and that's why I'm here. And so I was doing that job, and, and in that role, I worked alongside Rich for several years. So then, Fast forward 10 years, um, I'm then a, a consulting engineer, and I, I arrive at the doorstep of the new company where uh, Ramesh is working, and I hear he's trying to write his memoir. And that's because his son-in-law, who's here, um, Jonathan, um, was saying, hey, you need to write your stories down. You've got some great stories. I want my kids to know them when they grow up. You've got to write it down. You've got to write it down. And so Ramesh tries doing that. Now, as writers, we all know the importance of, of being critiqued, right? Yes? yes. So, um, his son-in-law, Ramesh sort of started writing his memoir, his son-in-law did him the honour of looking him straight in the eye and saying, Dad, this is boring. <laughs> so, I happened to meet Ramesh again after many years, um, shortly after that, and, and we got talking, and I said, look, you, you're writing it, you've written it like a, you know, a technical report, because that's what he's been, you've been trained to do. And um, so we talked about that, and, and, and I said, look, instead of, you've got to tell the story by showing the scene. You've got to, got to create the scenes and put the people, the reader, in those scenes. They've got to feel like they're there in the back streets of Bombay. And so we've got to, I, I think it's a great book. So here's Ramesh. Come along, and he's going to read the first chapter. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say thank you. Thanks all of you for coming here. And mainly I'd like to say thanks to Anne and Kevin for inviting and say, hey, if you can come here and present your first chapter. Before I do that, I just want to show you, book is not published yet because you said no WordPress.
but this is what the title looks like. Uh, it's an immigrant's memoir. Now, tell me more about an immigrant. I'm sure a lot of you people know some immigrant, or you for yourself, uh, an immigrant, or your parents came from uh, different countries. So this is a book, and the title is Tomorrow Will Be a Better Day. This title, my father kept talking to us for years and years. This was the hope that we lived in. When you are deep into a poverty back in India, when I left India, it was 400 million people. And when you are deep in a poverty that you are worrying about a next day where the half a gallon, half a cup of milk is gonna come. But when he kept reminding you, son, be an optimist, because tomorrow is gonna be a better day. And honestly, honestly, so true, my life, I said, my God, tomorrow is definitely a better day. And it turns out to be a fabulous day for me, because then I do, I'm so optimist. I'm married, my wife Mina is here, she has been, we've been married for 43 years. And that's a long time, but you know, I tell those people that I was married when I was 12. <laughs> I have two grown up children here, and both of them are living in, uh, in, in a ne one is in Neverville, and one is downtown Chicago. And here's my fabulous son in law for my older daughter, Jonathan. And as, John as, as Richard said, he was very instrumental in keep telling me, Dad, write your story. Because when you are growing up in India, when your pocket is completely empty, you are at nine brothers and sisters, and father and son, and you have no money because people are yelling at you. They want to get a hold of you because you haven't paid milk money or any money, and you are trying to make a good living, honest living, but there is no money. So when the life is tough like this, you know, I always say, Lord, thank you for giving me those days because that made me who I am today. And that's what I wanted to put it in the writing. So I graduated after borrowing a lot of money, graduated from a BS in microbiology, honors degree, and I said, you know, now mom, don't worry. Meanwhile, father had passed away at age of 50, so there is no bread earner. And I said, mom, don't worry, we'll be fine, because dad said tomorrow is gonna be a better day. Anyhow, graduated with the honors degree, and I'm very pleased to say, I'm gonna get a job, we'll have no problem. India at that time, 25% unemployment. And to get a job, you have to know somebody. You have to know somebody to get a job. And when you are poor, there is no connection. You're not going to find a job. Anyhow, landed in the USA, and life started unbelievable. As you are an immigrant, when I talked to a white man, they never understood me. When I talked to an African American, they never understood. I never understood anybody. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a truly a disaster. I mean, I said, what the heck am I doing here? But after 47 years, I'm doing well. Now, so let me read a chapter one that is going to be in the book. This is the place in Mumbai. Now, when I was growing up, it was known as the Bombay. And uh, year was 1955. I was uh, 10 years old. Can I bring it down a little bit so you can hear me, please? Oh, that's maybe better. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you, you should have told me earlier. Uh, <laughs> this is in Mumbai. Uh, I'm 1955, I'm 10 years old. And old Hanuman Lane, this is the apartment we are now living in. So I'm describing in this chapter an uh, apartment that I live in Bombay. I walked to a rat, scratching the floor inches from my head. I glanced up and made a sewing noise that sent it dashing past Hasubai, my older brother, who lay on the bed mat next to me. Rats and house lizards were regular visitors to our one bedroom apartment, entering through the cracks and opening in a rundown tenement building. As followers of a Jain religion, which is a part of a Hindu religion, but the purified branch of Hinduism called Jainism. As a followers of a Jain religion, we believed in non-violence to all creatures that did no harm to rodents or any other life form that came into contact with us. We had no pesticide. It cannot do it because that is against the law, against the religious law. Beyond Hasubai, there were four other siblings, my second older brother Bhupak and three sisters. Our parents and baby Rashmi slept in a small kitchen area beyond a partition my dad had constructed for privacy. We kept the window above my bed open at night to cool our third floor apartment. And from my bedmate, I could see a small section of the night sky. Sometime I would gaze at the stars 
and wonder if they would align kindly for me at the important moments of my life. We, the astrology played a very important role in Indian beliefs. When I got married, astrologer has to give a green signal before you can even marry. So that is a so important part of our life. Monsoon season had come early that day, and there were no stars that night. No stars that night. Instead, I listened to a periodic plink of a drop of water leaking from a ceiling, landing in one of several pans distributed around the room to catch the drips. Our apartment was located at the end of the tenement building, beneath the angled roof that caught, that caught the worst of the storm. In a monsoon season, mildew discolored the walls, washcloth hung dry, never dry completely. The room was always miserable. A sewer smell drifted through the window from the toilet located next to our apartment, used by all the residents on our floor. I turned to face the other way. At least that my ear did not hurt that morning, and my allergy was not bothering me. I frequently had an infection in my left ear, and that would wake up with a severe, severe pain. I was not a healthy child. Bhupat had a bigger problem. The second brother had a bigger problem. He had a contracted polio at age of three and needed a constant medical help. He had a weak legs and a hunchback. We teased him about being a favorite son because he had a special shoes to help him walk while the rest of us only had a simple flip-flop. When he was young, mom and other siblings fed him, bathed him, and carried him wherever he needed to go. Now at age 16, Bhupat weighed around 90 pounds and mangled and managed to get most places on his own. We slept on a cotton bed mat, one to two inches, two inches thick. The girls wore cotton nightgowns and boys wore an undershirt, an undershirt, loose cotton trousers called langa. Each morning when mom woke us, we would clear away the bed mats and stack them in a one corner of the room. In the evening, we would return the living space to a sleeping quarters, lay beside, laying out the bed mats beneath the washcloth hung dry. The total space was less than 400 square feet. That included kitchen. I pulled my knee tight to my chest to control my hunger pain. Soon mom would make a tea with the three parts of water and one part of milk. And that's all the milk we could get. And we would eat spicy snacks. Before going to school, we were pure vegetarian, which meant we had milk, cheese, and butter, but no eggs. The cheese and butter were expensive, and we rarely had them. When we did, the portions were very small. Mostly we had wheat chapatis, like a tortillas, vegetables, rice, and watery buttermilk. I loved the taste of milk, and sometimes I daydream of having a full glass of milk just to myself. Every day, Dad would arrive home, having used money he had earned to pay off a debt. When he left, what he had left wouldn't cover our daily expenses. So the next day, he would borrow again just to keep us afloat. Most evening, my parents discussed which debt should be paid next to maintain a reputation of honesty and integrity. The whole family joined in conversation. Sometimes I'd search the pocket of every piece of clothing in the apartment for a coin or a two that might help the situation. Often my brother and I took a detour on walking to the school to avoid the shouts about unpaid bills from vegetable vendors, milkmen, and grain owners. Whenever we became discouraged, my dad would put his arm on my hand and say, son, tomorrow will be a better day. Just keep your faith. In our sector of Bombay, businesses, warehouses, and tenement buildings mingled together, and it was not unusual for a rich and poor to live on a side by side. The very rich lived further south, and two miles away, the river Miti flowed through the city center. It formed the arc of arc known as the Necklace of Queen of England. The river was flowing into the Arabian Sea. And you can see a beautiful arc at the Bombay Bay that we used to call, and even English people call it, 
neck, necklace of Queen of England. Something I would, some mornings I would sneak upstairs to Mr. Wakil's apartment on the fourth floor. He was the wealthiest tenant and had a two newspaper delivered every morning. He was a kind man and would give me the paper when he would finish with them. But I needed to read the cricket news before I went to school. Then I could join in conversation with my schoolmates and we had listened to the radio commentary on a cricket, about cricket. We could not afford a radio, so I did not want my friends to know that we had no radio. We all worked hard to keep our poverty within the four walls of apartment. When the mango season came, my school, my school friends would talk about how great the mango they had the night before. I would nod my head and say, yes, it was a nice mango, but I had no mango until the season was over when the quality and the prices had dropped. Family reputation impacted every aspect of life. It defined the social status, how people treated us, who would we marry, who would find the job opportunities. With a few exceptions, rich people married the rich people and their children always got the best job. Time to get up, quickly now, mom voice rang out. The water tap will be closed down 40 minutes, within 40 minutes. Fetching water each morning was one of our childhood chores. The tenement building only had a one water supply, a single faucet outside the building entrance on the basement. A mom's call, we all got up, stacked our bedding and closed the window to suppress the growing sewer smell. The dead had already washed and was ready to go to work. My sister, Damuben, fetched bucket from the kitchen and together we headed the door to fetch more water for the house. When we returned, we had an 18 gallon of water tank in the house and each person got two to three gallons of water for bathing. We bathed, cleaned, cleaned clothes, washed dishes, and a three foot by three foot cement pad inside the kitchen. Next to the cement pad, there was a small clay stove about a 12 inch by 10 inches with a small opening in the side to collect the ashes. Mom would place charcoal in the base, pour the kerosene and light the charcoal with a match. The kitchen had no ventilation and always was smoky and a damp atmosphere. For drinking water, we poured city water through a double layer of cheesecloth and collected it in a clay pot that had a small copper faucet on the side. The cheesecloth collected some small insects, dirt, and other debris. Someday, we would even find a small worm up to half an inch length, and mom would sacrifice some precious charcoal to boil the water so we can drink it. The girls bathed first, then came the turn for the boys. While I waited for the my turn, I filled a small tin container with the water and joined the line of the people outside the door waiting for the toilet use. There was a one toilet for the 30 people that lived on the floor. A waste pipe ran along the side wall of the building into a downspout that fed a collection of pit in a ground level. Untouchables came daily to remove the solid waste from the pit. In a monsoon season, the big storm would sometimes overload the city drainage system and storm water would flow to the collection pit and turn the street into a river of contaminated mud brown water. Back in the apartment, my sister had finished bathing. I fetched the clothes that I would wear that day, filled a small bucket with the water, removed my night clothes and stepped into the cement pad. Beside me, mom tended the stove. I splashed the water on my face and torso, rubbed my skin with a hard soap and rinsed soap shivering when the cold water hit my spine. Then I dried off with a thin cotton towel already used by one of my siblings. A random thought entered my head. I squeezed out the towel. Maybe, maybe one day we would own a radio, have a towel each, 
and I could drink a full glass of milk every morning. I smiled. I smiled, I smiled at the impossibility, but I had to believe that tomorrow would be a better day. Thank you.